from St. Thomas. He says, What is in God without imperfection is found with some defect in creatures. Hence, if we attribute to God something found in creatures, we must entirely remove everything that smacks of imperfection, so that only what is perfect will remain. For it is only according to its perfection that a creature imitates God. Well, welcome back to Truths from the Text. My name is Aaron Ventura, and I'm here with Ryan Hurd. And today uh, we're going to continue to talk about uh, the perfections and how we uh, say certain uh, perfections about God. Uh, last episode, we talked about the difference between simple and mixed perfections. And so today we're going to do a little bit of review and practice on this uh, difference and specifically how you handle a mixed perfection. So Ryan, I'll pass it off to you. Yeah, so we talked about last time this distinction that is all throughout the history of theology, but especially arises from Anselm and his monologian between a predicate or a name taken from creatures that is only or pure perfection. We call it a simple perfection because it's uh, not composed of, of parts, I suppose, uh, versus a mixed perfection which is an act potency mixture, or more broadly, a perfection imperfection combo. And we gave example of, for example, saying God is wise or good or loves. Various sorts of names such as these are examples where the name, wise, good, loving, and so forth, um, is only perfection and nothing but perfection. And so we put these into God. We don't uh, leave anything out. Uh, of course, we know that God's love is greater and bigger than ours. So we want to account for that. But nonetheless, our love is really similar to God's own love. And so we say things like God is love, period. Whereas there's other names, and this is honestly, a more frequent situation that we face in theology, where when we look at what this creaturely reality is, it's not pure perfection. It's not pure actuality. It has some element of imperfection. And for that reason, we have a fundamental principle, like part of the operating system of a theological mind, where we remove the element of imperfection, and we retain the element of perfection. So this remove, retain, move uh, we introduced last time. And of course, the removal is targeting only the portion of the name, which is imperfect. So we take that, we throw it out, and then we attend to the remainder part of the predicate, the original predicate or name, which was purely perfection and nothing but perfection. And we can affirm that of God in an analogous way to where we say God is wise or good, full stop. So when we say God reasons or God laughs and others of this sort, these are examples of mixed perfection names, which require us to attend to their predicate, strike part of it off, with a negative judgment where we say God is not everything that reasoning involves. And after that negative judgment, which scoops off part to the side, the remainder, we say, well, this is the part that God has. Um, two texts in, in uh, Thomas's works where he talks more about this uh, on the larger scale, this method and principle of removing and retaining, as I like to talk about it, which uh, Aaron, uh, one of the texts Aaron read here at the beginning, uh, is De Veritate Q2A1 Ad 4, where Thomas talks about the fact that actually at the bottom of all of our names of God, which we take from creatures, the bottom, bottom, bottom reason for affirming something of God is because what is being affirmed is a little bit similar to God himself. So we say God loves 
because our love is a little bit similar to God's own real love. This is what we're always doing in some way, shape, or form whenever we make an affirmation, regardless of what kind of affirmation we're doing. We're always looking at the similarity point as a way to see God, so to speak, in the mirror of creatures. This is what Paul talks about in Romans 1, where he says, from the creation of the world is clearly seen. And then he gives various names of God, which are pointing to creaturely realities, proximately speaking, that are importantly similar to the real things of God. Um, if you view God for a moment as the sun in the sky and all creatures as little itty bitty mirrors, each one of those mirrors picks up a portion of the light of the sun and reflects it back. And therefore, as you and I go out into the creaturely world, we're attending to the reflected light, which brings us back to the nature of the sun. This is what we're doing in theology whenever we're making affirmative judgments of God. However, when we look at the various sorts of reflections among creatures, sometimes part of what's reflected is that pure light of divinity, so to speak. But sometimes it's shaded by dirt on the mirror, the limits and constraints of creatures as we contain only bits of divine goodness as God has uh, poured out, so to speak, uh, our being and life from his love for us. And these are examples of, again, mixed perfections where we have a mirror, there's a little bit of smudge or dirt on the mirror that dims the light. And then underlying that is the reflected light of the mirror. When we take that as a whole into theology, once again, we're only attending to the light portion or to speak otherwise, we're only attending to the similarity portion where our love is similar to God's love or our reasoning is similar to God's reasoning and so on. We're only attending to that similarity point and we are looking away from the dissimilarity, the dissimilarity, the element where um, we don't reflect God and we don't reflect God because um, as we uh, participate uh, existence, we do so in a shorter way than, than, than God does, so to speak. So we strike that dissimilar element with a negative judgment. We say God is not what is dissimilar to him, but rather is what is similar to him. And that's the remove, retain move that we're talking about. But running at that bottom level fundamental principle, when you look among creatures and you see something similar to God, affirmative him. When you look among creatures and see something dissimilar to God, well, deny it from him. So that's what St. Thomas is talking about here at the beginning of this quotation. Uh, and then he gives an example. Um, Aaron, you have any thoughts about this and more broadly though, as a fundamental principle before we dive into an example? Uh, I like the analogy of the, the mirrors and one of the great things about, uh, I think, doing theology, and we talked about this last time, is that it does require you to know reality, to know creatures, to go out and put your feet in the grass and look at how strong and tall a tree is or how firm and immovable a rock is so that you can look at the rock and praise the Lord that he is your rock and we do this uh, intuitively when we don't think of God as he's dirty with moss growing on him, um, but he's firm and immovable. And so I think that's a helpful practice to go look around and see what is befitting 
of God mm-hmm. and what is not befitting. And it, I think it, it just makes a lot of sense that you just remove whatever seems unfitting of God and you retain what is indeed fitting of him. And uh, as I think I've heard you say, this is basically all we do in theology. <laughs> uh, this is the, um, there's a lot more technicality, but it's it, a lot of the technicality, as, we're, as we'll uh, illustrate now when we talk about God reasons, is figuring out, okay, what is reasoning or what is knowledge? And that's usually the hard work of theology is just identifying your predicate, getting the content in your mind of what laughing is. What is the, uh, you know, when he who sits in the heavens laughs, in what sense, obviously God's not laughing at a dirty joke like a teenager. You have to think about what is the perfection of laughter that you can uh, attribute to God. So do you want to take us into this example of, of reasons? Yeah, so... Uh, Just again, reading the first part of this quote, um, everything in God is without any imperfection, fairly. Uh, I I do love it in the technicality of scholastic theology. My favorite part is when it starts to sound like grandma theology, because that's when you know it's really starting to get good. Everything in God is with no imperfection, but among creatures, we find Perfection mixed with defect or shortening. Defect here does not just mean something bad or evil, but just uh, limited uh, in some capacity. And therefore, Thomas says, for this reason, namely because we find perfection mixed with imperfection among creatures, whenever we take something and attribute it to God from creatures, we separate everything that pertains to imperfection and we keep back only what pertains to perfection. Again, the reason being uh, the creature is similar to God only according to how the creature is good, not according to how the creature uh, shrinks up goodness according to creaturely limits and the fact that we're made from dust. Okay, that's the principle. Thomas then applies this universal principle via an example to make it really concrete. And the example he uses is scientia, which can roughly speaking be translated as knowledge. Um, We don't want to get too technical here. As Aaron mentioned, a lot of the difficulty in theology, especially when you start getting in the medievals, although also among the fathers, is what on earth is scientia or this certain sort of knowledge. Scientia for St. Thomas is uh, very important. It's a certain kind of knowledge. Um, Like you and I often think more in terms of wisdom as a certain kind of knowledge, thinking as a certain kind of activity of the intellect. There's various activities that our mind does and scientia, science, Uh, not in our modern sense as the scientific discipline, but a certain sort of knowledge is a very important intellectual activity for St. Thomas. And therefore he always uses it as his example, or at least very often. Okay. Thomas says science or scientific knowledge contains both perfection and also imperfection. And he broadly says, There are two elements that make up this thing called scientific knowledge, this certain sort of knowledge. One is certainty, and the other is conclusionality. And I do apologize for my crazy English here. But certainty is the perfection part, and this conclusionality, for lack of better terms, is the imperfection part. And therefore, as we say, God has scientia or scientific knowledge, we take away conclusionality and we keep certainty. So let's make that a little clearer. When we say God has this sort of knowledge, we're attending to the fact that what God knows, God knows without any doubt or hesitancy, 
or difficulty, we might say. He knows things certainly. But God doesn't know things by concluding from more basic knowledge and learning to acquire more knowledge. That's roughly speaking what Thomas means here by conclusionality, where we grow, us creatures grow from more fundamental knowledge or more fundamental principles or more fundamental premises. We acquire and learn and we derive conclusions and more knowledge from the initial knowledge that we had. So as we take up this creaturely reality of scientia and we say it of God, we say God has scientia or scientific knowledge because God's knowledge is certain, not because God grows in knowledge or not because God learns. And uh, again, you can see how these moves are rather basic. Uh, I think everybody knows that God doesn't learn the knowledge that he has. Rather, he always already knew from eternity. He doesn't uh, depend upon creatures for his knowledge. Um, God doesn't have to uh, look out into the world and see things in order to know about them in a dependent fashion. God doesn't have to learn and think hard and reason and work things through and acquire, um, all of which, by the way, smack of imperfection. <laughs> so everyone knows that uh, it would be much better uh, if we didn't have to sit and think hard. It would mean that we would have more good in our minds because we already knew all knowledge rather than having to gather it up from the world, things like this. So we remove that, the imperfection, and we retain the perfection, which in this case is certainty. So Ryan, could you talk a little bit about um, the tools that we use to do the removing? So we started um, some episodes ago talking about negative theology or negations, and specifically that God is not a body. And there's other negations that we can use. And the way that I like to think about mixed perfections is you find the creaturely thing. So in this case, scientific knowledge. And then I go into my handy uh, negative theology toolkit. And I, th I think about, okay, what is the aspect of imperfection in scientific knowledge? Well, it's the, the coming from ignorance unto knowing. Mm -hmm. And I think, okay, obviously God doesn't have that. And then I can pick one of my many negations that I have in my toolkit that the Bible has given me that I, I know with certainty that God is not like. <laughs> so I know that uh, contrary to some theologians uh, uh, who think God does learn, uh, I, I know that he doesn't. And therefore I pull out my little negation and that's what I use to strike it. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on um, just that process of going into your negative theology toolkit to do some of the removal? Yeah. So uh, I think you've, you've gestured to it well uh, here. You know, um, in negative theology, we're often concerned to get really big scale negations. Um, things like God is not a body uh, is a negative judgment that gets a lot of traction. It does a lot of work. It's often used uh, to target bodily imperfections, for example, and so on and so forth. It recurs. It's a frequent tool in the theologian's toolbox. That's true. Sometimes, um, though, we need to just, so to speak, invent or perform a negative judgment, which is very ad hoc. It's only for this purpose. So in our current case, uh, God has scientific knowledge according to its certainty, not according to its derivation. Can, can I use, I, I hate saying conclusionality, this is ridiculous. Well, 
we probably are not going to camp out on the negation, God does not learn, in any sort of really robust or theological we're not going to start writing books about God's inability to learn or, or, or the fact that God does not learn and so far. We're not going to call it God's unlearnedness, the fact that God doesn't learn. Also, that probably doesn't communicate very well. We're not going to capitalize on this ne negation. Rather, we've just performed this negation ad hoc for this purpose of dealing with this predicate scientific knowledge. We're often doing that. And once again, we're removing, in case it wasn't clear, we're removing the imperfection part by using or performing or making a negative judgment. God does not learn, which is part of what's involved in scientific knowledge. That's option number one. We are sitting down and we just do a negative judgment. We do it, we leave it, we move on. Option number two, though, is bringing to bear a more, a more fundamental negation and allowing it to inform or targeting its negative power, its negating power, so to speak, to our certain situation that we're facing. So we might, for example, do this with the negation, God is not a body, which is a negative judgment which specifically removes bodiliness from God. But insofar as it's removed bodiliness, it's also removed this learning process by default. Why is that? Well, uh, that's a difficult metaphysical question. But Thomas points out the fact that even angels don't, properly speaking, learn. Now, they have dependent knowledge. God has independent knowledge, so to speak. But even they don't learn like we have to learn because learning is fundamentally an embodied phenomenon. It is an intellectual, intellectual activity which is only performed by an intellect insofar it's been shot through with dust. I'm quoting here from a guy named Isaac, uh, a medieval, very important. Intellect shot through with dust uh, is the definition of a human person. And therefore, the certain intellect shot through with dust, which is not an angelic intellect, but a human intellect, has certain unique activities proper to it such as learning or reasoning, moving from A to B, from ignorance to, to understanding. So in this case, we can take the larger and more fundamental and more important negative judgment, God is not body, and bring it to bear on the question of God's scientific knowledge, where we see Conclusionality or derivation is a feature proper to bodies. God does not have a body. Therefore, God, although he has scientific knowledge according to certainty, doesn't have this bit which accrues by virtue of having a body, namely the derivedness of his knowledge. So... We're, we're, we're doing often either one of those uh, uh, sorts of moves, either the ad hoc negative method or the pick your tool out of your negative theology toolbox method. And by the way, that latter method where we take, for example, God is not body and we bring it to bear is what we're very frequently doing when we are reading Holy Scripture. And one of the real payoffs of having a lot of negative tools in your toolbox is that they serve as negative principles for interpreting scripture. Negative principles for interpreting scripture. This is very important. They don't tell you what the text means. They give you wrong answers only. 
So again, if we go back to our more basic thing, when we read the text, God has a hand, I whip out my negative tool, God is not a body, and it adverts me to the fact of a wrong answer only, namely, God has a hand does not mean God has a hand. It hasn't told me what it does mean. It's given me the wrong answer only. In a similar way, if I were to read in text of scripture, God has scientific knowledge. Um, Thomas is reading scripture in the Vulgate version in Latin. And so there are a few texts. Oh, the depths of the wisdom and the scientia of God is how Thomas reads Paul's uh, famous thing, the text in uh, Romans. I forget the exact reference. Okay, here scripture is making you say God has science, God has scientific knowledge. He allows these negative judgments to be negative principles of interpreting, giving you wrong answers only. We still have to do the hard work of interpreting the text, but at least we've uh, guarded ourselves from screwing it up too badly. Hmm. There's there's two texts. Uh, hopefully this does not muddy the waters, but um, there's a lot of prophetic visions where a prophet will see um, things that don't have bodies like angels. Um, and I think of Ezekiel, how even the Hebrew, e even the text itself is straining when it's going multiple layers of, I saw the likeness of a likeness uh, that was the form kind of like a man. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I, one of my favorite ones is th there's that meme out there about um, what, an, you know, seeing an angel or you look like an angel. And then it's this um, terrifying being with wings and like eyes all around oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I actually really like this because uh, you, it, it just shows you your limits of a, of bodily knowing. That you can't even know an angel, we're not even talking about God, you can't even know an angel without God accommodating to you mm -hmm. some bodily metaphor. So you think, how many eyes do a, does a human being have? Two eyes. And then God says, let me show you what angelic knowledge, or at least the cherubim mm -hmm. are like, or the wheels of my chariot, mm -hmm. eyes everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually exactly how I would try to explain to my three-year-old son. Mm -hmm. Well, you know how you have two eyes and can't see behind you mm -hmm. or above you? Well, the spirit of God has eyes all around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I've got the little negation in my head. Obviously, God, not even angels have bodies, but yeah. he's got eyes everywhere. Yeah, he can um, see all things. Yeah. I mean, exactly. we, we do this also with our children when we say uh, mom has eyes in the back of her head. Uh, yeah. I, I just firmly remember as a child, like, how does mom know that? Well, her knowing powers were greater than mine. And so what would she say? Well, I have eyes in the back of my head. Similar capacity. The addition of eyes means God, ha God has eyes everywhere. Yeah. He, uh, he knows all things. Exactly. Yeah. Uh in uh, in Genesis twenty two, there uh, you can tell me if this is gonna lead us too far astray. But uh, so when God has Abraham uh, go sacrifice his son, but then he he doesn't, and he stops his hand, and then he says, um, "Now I know that mm. you fear God." Mm. Um, this I think this is one example where you know at least what it can't mean. Mm -hmm. And even though the text on just the surface of the letters is, it sounds like God learned something about Abraham. Mm -hmm. And then as most of the commentators take it, well, this is the sense of God's actually making Abraham to know mm -hmm. what is in his heart. Mm -hmm. And it's spoken metaphorically. Mm -hmm. And you have similar moves happening in Mark 13. So for those of you who know we're preaching through Mark 13 right now, it's going to say not even the angels in heaven or the son of man knows the day of his own return. Hmm. You could take, so we know what it can't mean because Jesus hmm. knows everything as God. 
And then it leaves you with basically two options. Either he doesn't know, according to his humanness, his human nature, and that's how a lot of people go. Or you could also take it in the sense of Genesis 22, that the Son of Man is not causing you disciples to know, mm. and it's spoken of in this different sense. So I like this principle of, I know what it can't mean. I know what mm -hmm. my options are not. I've removed those. And then I know, here's my handful of other potential options. And then I got to do more work to kind of pick and choose yeah. which is the most most likely. Any yeah. comments or thoughts on on those texts? No, I think, I think that's great. Uh, I have nothing to add. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't know if Thomas has a text on this, but I'm, I am interested in the mixed perfection of laughter. Uh, mm. Do you want to give any gestures towards that? Or do you know any places where he handles that mixed perfection? You know, he handles it a, a number of places. I, I, I don't know them off the top of my head. One of the reasons this is not answering your question. This is, I'm, I'm not not able to at the moment. But uh, one of the reasons why uh, Thomas uses reasons, laughs, and others of this sort, this is how he speaks, um, as his examples, is because these are what philosophically are unique to only one thing in the entire universe, a human person. So when we hear a hyena produce the sound that sounds a lot like man's laughter, we often call it laughter, but it's not actually laughter because although it mimics the sound, it has not grasped something funny. And part of what it is to laugh is knowing with your mind something funny. So all the way down lower than us on the food chain, nobody has laughter, properly speaking. What about higher up the food chain? Well, an angel, for example, could grasp something funny, but nonetheless, he doesn't have the bodily element to produce the sound. And therefore, risibility, the capacity to laugh, that's what risibility means, um, is proper or unique to man only. It follows human nature. And same thing with reasoning. So the intellects with dust element, um, you look at all the other things lower on the food chain that have dust, none of them have the capacity to perform intellectual acts of knowing. They can only quasi know, so to speak, with their senses. Um, then you look higher up the food chain, angels, and then God, um, they have intellects, but no dust, no body. And therefore, the ability to reason is unique to man. Okay. So Thomas uses reasoning, laughing, and then others of that sort, um, because there's no philosophical ambiguity here. We know and we can know philosophically and even rather easily uh, on based upon what I just said, that if something which is not a human is said to laugh, we know that something funny is going on. Um, perhaps it's imitating the sound of human laughter, like a hyena. And this is why it's true that a hyena laughs. Not that he actually has laughter, we would say, but because it's akin to laughter according to the sound, yeah? And then there's various other usages. So how would we say God laughs? Well, an initial shot would be, positively speaking, God laughs insofar as he does something similar to a man who has laughter. Um, often a man who has laughter, for example, when it says, um, you know, God, uh, it was a Psalm 2. I'm, I'm uh, Yeah, he who sits mind. in the heavens, Heaven, laughs, heavens laughs. Thank holds you. his foes in derision. Yep. Exactly. He holds his foes in the derision. So what is the saying of God? Well, a man who laughs is somebody who has recognized his opponent doesn't have 
squat. Can I tell a little story? My dad is a shockingly strong arm wrestler. All my life, I've tried to arm wrestle my dad. I'm going to count it one day, one of my great accomplishments, if I can beat my dad. But my dad is so strong that every single time I arm wrestle him, he just genuinely, no joke, he just laughs and pump all, I'm all the way down on the floor, on, on, on the table every time. And let me tell you, like, it was very annoying for most of my life. Now, now I also laugh because it's just, it's just hilarious. I've got nothing on him. Similarly, in the case of God, Psalm 2, God is said to laugh because when it comes to the great arm wrestling match of God and all the foes of the believer, it's just not even a competition. It's over before it starts. And therefore, he is said to laugh. That maybe is a shot uh, of the initial direction that we might want to, to go. I think that's that's a pretty good shot. Um, I'll, I'll close this off by just reminding us of these different categories of uh, positive names. So at the top with simple perfections, I think you said Thomas's is stock are good, wise, and other similar. So those yep. are your simple perfections. You can just kind of say them full stop. And then mixed perfections, which is what we've been talking about here. Reasons, laughs. And I never noticed until you just pointed it out that those are two things that are uh, uh, properties uniquely of human beings. Mm -hmm. Okay, I could, now I can see more why he uses, uses those. And then the bottom or the purely symbolic names mm -hmm. where we remove everything and then we just have this, this metaphorical name he uses rock, lion, and, and then I like to remind myself the passions, mm -hmm. um, wrath, yep. uh, others of those, uh, any comments on those three kinds of names or those stock examples for folks? No, I, I think it's, uh, you know, just a manner of learning how to say those stock things really well, really clearly spotting the patterns. So patterns are really important. And then as we go about the world, even when you don't know exactly what a certain predicate is, you can often get by because it's kind of sort of like something, you know, really, really well. That's kind of the design of Thomas's system. So Thomas knows that uh, saying God laughs, God reasons, and so on. Not super frequent, not super helpful, but he does it so that in all the many actual situations, when maybe we're not exact in our philosophical knowledge, a very frequent Holy Scripture, we at least have something to go on. So spotting the patterns and learning the patterns uh, is really the goal here. Hmm. Great. All right. Well, uh, we'll continue on. And uh, I said uh, to the church, Hey, by the time we get to episode 10, if you feel like things are way over your head, just, just trust this, trust the process. When you get mm -hmm. to episode 10, go back to episode one and you'll be like, Hey, I, I know what Ryan is talking about. Uh, I know what Aaron is talking about. So we've got one more episode, uh, to go until we get to that uh, that episode 10, and then you guys can go back. Please do reach out with any questions or things that you continue to find difficult. Uh, and you know, if you wanna go study angelic knowledge, there's few people better to study from than Thomas. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, go go to his, uh, his Summa and uh, read, read all about how angels how angels laugh. What is the sound of an angel laughing? Mm -hmm. um, you, you can uh, uh, do some fun metaphysics there. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll finish up there. Until next time, keep on reading.